Good afternoon and good morning, depending on where you are, to our webinar of today, which is entitled with the overarching title, The Future of the International Rule of Law, Perspectives from the US and the EU. This webinar is organized by the America Europe Fund at the KU Leuven, as well as the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies here at KU Leuven. It's a great pleasure to welcome all of you, and I see that many of you have joined the invitation to this webinar for tonight, only a couple of days before Christmas. But it's a, a very pertinent question that we are asking tonight. What is actually the future of the international rule of law? To answer that question, we have been very lucky. Uh, we have been very lucky to actually have three eminent uh, scholars with us who have widely published on the international rule of law. And I would like to introduce them to you before we say a little bit more uh, about the topic of tonight's webinar. Um, first, we have with us Professor Heike Krieger from the Freie Universität Berlin. She holds the chair for international uh, and public law at the Freie Universität Berlin. And she recently um, published um, the edited volumes Lawmaking and Legitimacy in International Humanita Humanitarian Law, as well as the international rule of law rise or decline question mark approaching current foundational challenges. Welcome and good evening, Heike Krieger. And we also have with us um, tonight Ian Hurt, Professor Ian Hurt from Northwestern University. He's a professor of political science and director of the Weinberg College Center for International and Area Studies. And um, Professor Ian Hurd is actually, just like Heike Krieger, an eminent scholar due to his many publications on international relations, but also and foremost, the international rule of law, such as in his book, How to Do Things with International Law, which examines the ideology of the rule of law in international affairs. He's currently also writing a book called The Life and Times of the International World Order. Good morning, uh, Professor Ian Hurd. And then, last but not least, we have with us Professor Jan Wouters, Jean Monnet Chair at Personam and Director of the Leuven Center for Global Governance Studies at KU Leuven. Uh, Jan Wouters has published widely on international and EU law, international organizations, global governance and corporate and financial law. Uh, some of his recent co-authored volumes are International Law, A European Perspective, and the European Union and Human Rights. Good evening, Professor Wouters. Let me, after this brief introduction to our um, scholars who have joined us tonight, uh, also introduce to you a little bit the subject matter, the international rule of law. In fact, over time, we may argue that international rules, principles, and universal values, as well as multilateral organizations, have become important reference points and arenas of international action. Um, one may argue that no state in the world can actually neglect them. And indeed, uh, states have increasingly complied and even strengthened international rules and universal norms, including human rights, uh, over the last decades. However, uh, the international rule of law, we may argue, uh, has also been undergoing significant contestation and changes. Uh, major international actors, including um, some uh, of those who have actually founded the liberal international order, such as the United States, have challenged international agreements, multilateralism, and universal values over the last couple of years. Now, of course, with the new uh, American US um, administration, the Biden administration, this may change. But also, we have to see how other actors, how other states, contribute 
to the making of the international rule of law, uh, not to forget also the many uh, non um, state actors that are contributing to the interpretation, but also the ongoing um, perception of the international rule of law. Under these circumstances, uh, on the one hand, an international rule of law that has been really thriving, but also that has been very much contested over the last couple of years, what are the prospects for this international rule of law? What will the future look like? And to which degree does a change in the US leadership open new ways of supporting the international rule of law? What will the role for the EU be in the international rule of law given the new constellation due to the incoming Biden administration. We have uh, set these questions forward to our um, colleagues. Um, we have said in the title that we are going to look into European and American perspectives, but obviously every scholar tonight here on our roundtable discussion will speak for her or himself. So without further ado, let me um, give the floor to Professor Krieger from the Freie Universität Berlin. Uh, we will then go on with an intervention of Professor Hurt and Professor Wouters. And obviously you can always ask questions in the chat. Uh, we will have ample opportunities to actually go into an in-depth discussion with all of you after the intervention of our speakers, but please feel free to pose these questions whenever you like. Heike Krieger, I would like to give the floor to you. Uh, thank you, Kolja, for, for your kind introduction and for inviting me here. It's really an interesting and, and challenging event and I'm very much looking forward to our discussions. I would like to uh, start by just reflecting what you have just said, that the international rule of law is currently undergoing significant challenges and contestations. And if we look into literature, we see a number of uh, theories advancing reasons and causes for the state. Some point to the shifts in the geopolitical order, um, others point um, to, um, um, yeah, to, to a diffusion of agency among state and non-state actors with huge diverging cultural identities that have rendered it difficult to find agreement on the international level. To my mind, um, it is important to under for understanding the current challenges to an institutionalized multilateralism and an international rule of law. Um, for understanding these, it is uh, uh, indispensable to look at the role of uh, Western states, of EU states and the United States themselves uh, in order to see what they have contributed to the current state of affairs. And um, I think that in particular, or I want to focus in particular today in our discussion on the use of informal networks in making as well as in enforcing international law, because to my mind, they have played a decisive role in undermining the international rule of law. And I think that the facts of these um, networks, coalition of the willing should be contained in future policies, especially by actors such as the European Union. Because the end of the Cold War did not only see a rise in multilateralism, but in an institutionalized multilateralism, but in parallel, US foreign policies also fostered such informal networks to coalition of the willings, which under the lead of the US circumvented many formal structures. Examples you all know reach from the 1999 military intervention in Kosovo via the proliferation security initiative to the financial action task force. And the turn to informal, informalism was based on a twofold claim that in the interest of efficiency and for the protection of universally conceived values, fluid and flexible forms of cooperation are preferable to cumbersome legally embedded multilateralism. With the waning of the unipolar, unipolar moment, the promises of informality have also attracted actors from the global south. And I think that the Chinese Belt Road Initiative is a very clear case in point uh, for, for an effort that relies on informality and bilateralism instead of a structured and legally embedded multilateralism. So why am I concerned? 
I think these informal cooperations are useful instruments for hegemonic actors because they work outside procedural and substantive legal frameworks. The actor at the center of the network may unilaterally set the rules and may decide who's in and who is out and what objectives to pursue. So these structures uh, aggravate power asymmetries and, uh, uh, and foster a hierarchization of the international order. And I think this process has um, strongly overshadowed the instrumentalization of informal network structures for realizing substantial global values and have discredited the efforts of Western state in this regard. At this time, point of time, I guess that legally embedded multilateral structures do not seem promising for very different actors. Against rising resistance to its hegemonic rule, the retreat of the US from multilateral institutions and its turn to informality may be seen as a rational decision to rebalance uh, costs and benefits uh, in the current order. China might not be yet at least completely prepared to take over the, the global lead. Uh, and it also still meets with skepticism around the globe. And the states from the global south are still confronted with a lack of inclusiveness and transparency and with many obstacles for integrating their interest into the international rule of law and into existing structures. Against this background, two narratives are currently spreading. One that aims to reinforce existing multilateral institutions and one that pushes for a fundamental restructuring. Actors favoring such a fundamental restructuring apparently intend to turn their back on a universalist type of legally embedded multilateralism and instead aim at alliances and partnerships of the like-minded based on values that work hand in hand with interests. And I quote that here, uh, is also the idea of gradual strategic decoupling from competitors and rivals, which may even imply shattering the dream of all humanity working together as one towards shared visions and goals. So, I mean, these are romantic words, but they point to the fact that the idea that lay beneath the 1990s should be completely left and, and we kind of decouple in different ideological groups or groupings. Um, Forging alliances and working together with like-minded partners is of course an essential tool in all types of diplomatic practices, but a restructuring of the international order through a value-based deeper integration, which excludes geopolitical rivals and operates outside legally embedded institutions entails a number of risks that I think democratic states should not be, well, too willing to take. Actively pursuing this path would push for a disaggregation of the international order into separate ideological networks. And these networks would either shun legal institutionalization or decouple intensified forms of legal institutionalization from global development. Against this background, let me think about a number of policy options that are available for EU member states. Um, and uh, my answer to, to these question and policy options is to take uh, a closer look at the objectives that the Alliance for Multilateralism that has been brought about by France and Germany pursues. Um, and this alliance uh, tries to, let's say, combine both elements, reform existing international institutions and, and I quote, protect, preserve and advance international law. So, Germany and France, there's a huge concern for international law so that they think they even have to protect it. Um, I think these efforts reflect the alliance awareness and probably the broader awareness of EU member states that in particular middle powers profit from international law as a stabilizing factor and uh, therefore have to look for policy options how to protect international law. Just from, from any possible policy options, I want to pick out uh, basically two, which might seem tiny, but I think that in the long run, uh, these are important elements. And the one is promoting lawmaking initiatives on the global level, and the other is acting themselves consistently, credibly, and compliantly. To my mind, EU member states should aim to widen the public space for transparent and inclusive negotiations on global values through lawmaking initiatives. 
The unipolar position of the US in the 1990s seems to have concealed that value conflicts and contestations have always played a significant role and more importantly, have not hindered the development of international law. I think we owe the insight to Jan Wouters and his research on stagnation of treaties that many of the international treaties that have entered into force or have become more important after 1990 have been concluded during the period of the Cold War. Let me just name uh, the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. In particular, in periods marked by tensions between great powers, legally embedded multilateral structures offer at least a forum for exchange and negotiation. Often operating on the basis of one state, one vote, they ensure a broad level of participation for all actors, and the decision to include new actors is not a decision of political appropriateness, but often a decision of, political obli of legal obligation. Thus, states do not need to share common values from the outside, but can find a public space where diverging voices are heard and opposing claims can be raised. These processes offer to the less powerful at least a space to continuously renegotiate agreements. Thus, it is not surprising that many voices from the global south, be it political actors or be it academics, actually still favor such a kind of law-based uh, multilateralism. Accordingly, European states should reinvest in efforts in, in the conclusion of future um, of, of major multilateral treaties. One important initiative that springs to mind could, for instance, be the possible Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Crimes Against Humanity. I'm well aware that states with hegemonic aspirations such as China, Russia, and the US are apparently unwilling to in reinvest, in particular in this uh, convention, but I still think the effort is worth uh, one pursuing. And once you have an initiative going, uh, it will have a certain attraction. Another relevant initiative concerns attempts from small island states to build coalitions of states within the UN General Assembly to request an advisory opinion of the ICJ um, on, on obligations relating to climate change or another initiative to create a commission of small island developing states on climate change and international law, which will seek for a pertinent decision by the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea. So the idea is make law work and, and show that legal structures are still in place and, and can make a meaningful difference. The loss of international law legitimacy that resulted from policy of the global north as a consequence of exceptionalism via informal network structures should also be uh, addressed through acting consistently, credibly, and compliantly. International law and the international rule of law, like all law, needs to meet certain criteria for being perceived as legitimate. And these include generality, consistency, and congruence between rules and state actions. Fulfilling these prerequisites is essential if law shall create a sense of commitment. And Jutta Brunet and Stephen Tupi have put it this way, that law depends on actors that collaborate to build shared understandings and uphold a practice of legality. And in that sense, law needs nurturing. Thus, what remains decisive to my mind for European states to do is to contribute to practices of legality and to take them serious. And I guess there are numerous cases where practices of legality are actually endangered by EU member states themselves. And I just want to pick out uh, two that are of, of concern recently, but you could add uh, lots more. Um, one practice of legality that is particularly problematic is the silence of European Union states uh, in relation to violations of the prohibition on the use of force, in particular, where with such uh, violations are committed by close allies. Um, several pertinent cases uh, concern the lack of a clear and unequivocal condemnation of US airstrikes, for instance, in 2017 and 2018 in Syria in relation to chemical weapon uh, uh, um, uh, installations. 
Um, but we, we could name other examples, and I guess this is a, a more broadly shared concern in current uh, academic literature. Monika Hakimi has recently published an article on why Article 2.4 is now finally killed, and uh, she shares the concern that not talking about viol legal violations, not justifying acts in legal terms, is a particularly grave challenge that we are currently facing. And indeed, I think that is really a, a persisting challenge for an international rule of law. So European states could do something against that, despite uh, uh, alliances and loyalties. I think the same hold, holds also true where states from the global north tend to call or, or to point their fingers to states and non-state actors from the global south with respect to other violations of international law, but are themselves not prepared to accept international control themselves. Um, such a reluctance to accept international control is often justified by arguing that our own accountability mechanisms are more effective and less biased than international ones. However, simply pointing the finger to others is to my mind not sufficient for creating strong legal practices that foster a commitment to law. So a case in point, for instance, is the International Humanitarian Fact-Finding Commission under uh, additional protocol one of the Geneva Conventions in its 30 in years of existence and despite of 76 states recognizing its competence, the commission has only been deployed once in Ukraine and for instance Germany uh, was not willing to, to put the 2010 Kunduz airstrike before the uh, fact-finding commission. So I think a lot could be done here. On a concluding note, um, if members of the alliance and EU member states are indeed resolved to protect and to promote international law, they should be more careful with their conceptual framing. States from the global north have more and more adopted the terminology of a rules-based international order instead of referring to international law, a practice which actually stems from US foreign policy. The use of the terms, however, oblivious to the negative impacts that the turn to informalism has exerted on the international order. EU member states thereby align themselves with practices that were explicitly conceived of to circumvent legally embedded multilateral institutions, and this creates fractions. Even worse, by adapting this US approach, many states of the EU have left the rhetorical reliance on international law as the decisive frame for international relations to Russian and Chinese policies. The Russian foreign minister has accused members of the alliance to promote effective multilateralism instead of UN's inclusive multilateralism. And I quote, by imposing the concept of a rules-based order, the West seeks to shift the conversation on key issues to platforms of its liking where no dissident voices can be heard. Members of the Alliance, I think, cannot simply deny these allegations by putting to the bad face in which they have been voiced. I think the mere content of the argument corresponds to widespread, widespread observations by academic observers and should therefore be taken seriously. All the things I have mentioned might be tiny details, but I think uh, these tiny details matter and that speaking about law and speaking in terms of law is a most important way forward to safeguard an international rule of law. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heike, for your intervention. And um, I think you reminded um, us of the need uh, of the global north uh, to look for solutions itself rather than pointing um, to the contestation of others in the uh, context of strengthening uh, international law, uh, the international rule of law, um, both in rhetoric but also in practice. And uh, to put it very simply, uh, what you have um, elaborated on in much greater detail over the last couple of minutes. I'm now very curious to see um, what um, Ian is going to share with us. Ian, I give you the floor. Um, and we are very much looking forward to your intervention. Thanks so much. I'm very happy to be here. That was a really interesting presentation from Heike. Uh, the concept of the international rule of law is such a uh, an open-ended and intriguing one. Uh, what I'm gonna do is take a step back a little bit and think about what the, the political context and meaning is of the term, since it seems to me that the more we unpack the phrase, the more interesting and nuanced everything becomes. Uh, 
But I'll start by, by just pointing out the obvious, that it's, it's so common to hear whenever there's an international uh, crisis in the news, the suggestion that the situation would be improved if all the parties would simply uphold their international legal obligations. Whether we're talking about the Syrian use of chemical weapons or American special trade tariffs or, or torture, compliance with the law of nations is often prescribed as kind of the cure to recalibrate policies that have gone wrong. And I'm very curious about what's at work in that, uh, in that formulation. Um, it seems to me the conventional view of the international rule of law is built on a couple of components. The overall view, as I understand it, is the suggestion that political decisions of governments should defer to international legal rules. This is a version of the concept of legal supremacy, and it creates a kind of political authority hierarchy in which uh, the rules, the legal rules to be, to be so specific, um, are in a superordinate position over the governments uh, that are taking their decisions. And this has a, an institutional component and a normative one. On the institutional side, international law is understood as providing a framework that facilitates the coexistence between governments. Laws on diplomatic immunity, for instance, non-interference, peaceful settlement of disputes, this whole catalog helped to organize intergovernmental relations and give a kind of civility to world politics. But there's the second normative component that brings to to mind substantive values, such as the commitment to human rights, the protection of refugees, uh, the protection against nuclear proliferation. And on the normative side, it's said to be important, uh, the rule of law, the rule of law is said to be important because it enhances human welfare and other substantive goals that are encoded by the law. Now, these two strands are obviously distinct. This is nothing new to anybody here. They're distinct, but they agree on the conclusion that compliance with the rules is beneficial and that violations of the rules lead to international disorder at best and violence at worst. So I see this as the kind of conventional framing of the international rule of law uh, in its political setting. And it leads to the policy suggestion that governments should follow their legal obligations and that the world is better off when they do that. As scholars then, this view encourages researchers to ask questions about how and when and why governments comply with the rules and how they might be induced to do it more often. This is, uh, I think, the standard research question that comes out of the language that suggests that there's a a contemporary crisis in the international rule of law, uh, that it's in decline. Scholars are motivated to, to think about how it might be revived or protected or defended. I'm interested in a slightly different question that focuses on what governments do with the law and why and with what effects. In this sense, I'm thinking of international, the international rule of law as an ideology in the way that Shirley Scott defined it uh, 20 or so years ago. And at the presumptions on which it rests and the practices that it makes possible. So in the power of the international rule of law, uh, or we see the power of the international rule of law on display in the ways that governments and others make use of legal resources to justify, to understand, and to, to act in the world. This is a kind of social power, but it's built on the widely shared idea that the rule of law defines the appropriate uh, menu of choices that should be used by governments and perhaps by others in the service of their own goals and also uh, in common goals. So this is simply a long-winded way to observe that international law is often used to legitimize state policy and that this is a characteristic feature of contemporary international politics. It's a pervasive political practice that's meaningful to those who engage in it, as well as legible to a wider audience. And I see this as a, 
a social practice in the sense that the philosopher Charles Taylor uh, has, uh, has unfolded the idea of social practices. Um, in this sense, the social practice of invoking legal justifications links together states and the legal environment in which they exist in a way that Charles Taylor is called dialogic. And we get from this as well, a reinforcing of this background assumption that compliance is a normative good and non-compliance is a normative bad. Now, what's so interesting to me is that once we move this ideal theory to the world of practice, as Heike has pointed out, there is a problem in that all sides generally claim to be complying with the rules. And their political fights often center on what it means to comply. So for instance, as, as Monica Hakimi actually has pointed out, all sides in war these days tend to argue that they're acting in self-defense. And that's clearly because the laws of war in Article 2.4 of the Charter define self-defense as a permissive, permissible kind of, of war. But these disagreements over who's acting in self-defense aren't going to be resolved by looking closer at the law. We can't look at Article 2.4 and read it more carefully in order to answer the question of whether the US bombing in Syria is genuinely part of a self-defense project or something else, or whether Russia's killing of its political exiles in Britain counts as aggression against the UK or not. These questions rest on political judgments that are made using the categories and resources of law. The problem, of course, is that in a, a positivist social science way, many people would wish to code acts of states as compliance or non-compliance. But when we get into these sorts of disputes, I suggest that that kind of coding uh, requires either abstracting away from the political context that is at the heart of the dispute or making uh, quite large assumptions about the existence of uh, universal categories that give meaning to the law. For some scholars, of course, what I'm suggesting here, this instrumental and justificatory use of the law reads like an inappropriate politicization of law that contradicts the very idea of the international rule of law. And from my view in, in international politics, I see things the other way around and would suggest that the international rule of law is defined by this instrumental use of law mixed in with political goals and projects. The legalization of international politics that we have seen over the last 50 years or so is the, the, exactly the process that gives political weight to legal rationalizations. The political weight of legal arguments makes them worthwhile and important sites of contestation for governments. The stakes are really high for governments to show themselves to be compliant with the law. It makes sense for actors to contest their actions in the language of law precisely because the language of law is so powerful because the idea of the international rule of law is so pervasive. So as we recognize what I'm suggesting here, a close connection between international law and, and politics, uh, it opens a way for considering the political productivity of international law as Isa Hussein has defined it. And this is the observation then that international law is not only regulative and constraining, it's also empowering and permissive as it defines some acts as unlawful and others as lawful. It makes the former harder to do or more expensive for governments to do and the latter easier. So the availability of legal justification smooths the way for action just as much as its unavailability impedes it. For scholars, I think this is the source of a, a kind of trouble. If we look at only one side of this balance, then we misunderstand the politics of international law. By this, I mean, uh, for the UN Charter on the Laws of War, for instance, if we see only that Article 
outlaws the use of force, the constraining aspect of law, we miss the way that it and Article 51 empower the use of self-defense as a legal justification uh, that makes it easier to go to war under a self-defense heading. So the charter creates this new legal resource of self-defense that has the power to differentiate between lawful and unlawful war. But that's a really powerful resource for governments. And we shouldn't be terribly surprised, I guess, that they have been using it with great enthusiasm since 1945. So all of this to wrap up here is suggesting that um, the, the central idea of the international rule of law is, I think, widely endorsed and rarely opposed. And it, it successfully creates a system of government, governance for the globe that is hierarchical and political. It defines what the units in the society can do. It is very successful at that. But it doesn't answer questions about um, practical disputes uh, where there are competing versions of what the law permits. And I think that in the practical world, this is gonna be a characteristic feature of disputes between governments. So it's unrealistic to assume that the international rule of law is either a neutral framework outside of politics or that it naturally produces substantively good outcomes. A more pragmatic approach would begin by acknowledging law's implication with politics and proceed from there to consider in specific interests, in specific instances, what interests are being served and how, and who is being empowered and who is disempowered by international rule of law promotion. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ian, for your intervention and for reminding us of the um, political, uh, the political dimension of the uh, international rule of law and the impact that the political has uh, on the international rule of law. Um, also underlining now in your concluding uh, words that um, the rule of law is not necessarily a neutral framework and um, is actually empowering um, uh, actors uh, unequally. Uh, so we may come back to that in, in the discussion because I find that very, very interesting in the, in the current context. And I see also the connection to the intervention of Heike here, um, who has also uh, spoken a lot about the Global South and the Global North. Um, I would like to give the floor now to, to Jan Wouters and um, uh, his intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Raube, dear colleagues, dear audience. Um, it's a great pleasure to participate in this uh, event. And I'd like to basically structure my initial um, brief intervention um, with three main, main points. First of all, I'd like to do a little bit of, uh, <clears throat> let's say, an overview of what I would consider uh, worrying uh, and uh, more positive tendencies with regard to the international rule of law what is going badly, what is going better. Uh, the second point I'd like to make is a, a few considerations regarding a very uh, recent development, and that is the report that the United Nations Secretary General Guterres has uh, presented on the 10th of September this year, and which is called Our Common Agenda. A very, very rich uh, report with many, many proposals, uh, including on the rule of law to strengthen international cooperation. And then last but not least, the European Union, what we can say about the role of the EU um, with regard to the international uh, rule of law. But let me start with, let's say, doing this kind of quick um, overview of what I see as very worrying tendencies with regard to the international rule of law and what I would then would also see as new, more positive dynamics. It's not complete, it's not exhaustive, it's actually to trigger your interest and, and our common thinking. About it. Let's start with the bad news, the deterioration. Some things have already been uh, hinted at. I think, first of all, um, there is, I would say, ever more free riding and collective action problems with regard to, um, let's say, 
what I call the tragedy of the commons. You know the expression very well. Our oceans, uh, outer space, climate, and so on are uh, becoming ever more threatened, and uh, we still don't have proper mechanisms for it. We do have some mechanisms, I'll come back to that, but some of them appear to be not very uh, powerful or even totally outdated. So free riding and collective action problems. Secondly, what Heike has already referred uh, uh, to, we have done some work about uh, the fatigue that we detect with uh, countries in the world uh, for formal, formal law mechanisms and formal commitments, binding legal instruments and so on are nowadays in many areas of international law really not popular and states sometimes really explicitly reject um, the road towards more uh, binding legal instruments. So I can give a couple of examples in that respect. But uh, the third uh, one, which I really find very serious and which I, I have the feeling that this has been mounting in the last say 10 years or so, it's what I would call the banalization of serious violations of international law, especially with regard to humanitarian law and the law of, on the use of force. It has already been mentioned on the use ad bellum, but let's also think about the incredible amount of war crimes that have been committed on an almost routine basis in places like Yemen, the Syrian conflict and so on. It's just uncountable. And it's such deep, deep, deep saddening that um, this is actually just, yeah, this is in the news and it looks like nobody seems to really uh, uh, much worry about it uh, anymore. Uh, a fourth thing, uh, also a, a topic on which we are currently working in Leuven uh, is the contestation of norms, of principles of international law of, or say existing international organizations Contestation, which is a very wide phenomenon and which, uh, again, I, I cannot explain in full details here, but it goes from, let's say, the rise of emerging powers that, that uh, feel they were not sufficiently, um, let's say, uh, involved in the actual elaboration of existing regimes to uh, the contestation by the United States, who was involved and even uh, wrote uh, single-handedly many of the rules of the current international liberal, liberal order that uh, United States, at least under the previous administration, was also rejecting parts of that uh, liberal uh, order. But there is also, as you know, the very, um, let's say, contestation vis-a-vis -vis international organizations which are considered uh, becoming too powerful. This goes from uh, either totally quitting international organizations, think of Brexit, but think also of the U United States quitting uh, UNESCO or the UN Human Rights Council and so on, to um, uh, the more, let's say, subtle but not less uh, cynical alternative, which is ruining international organizations from the inside. Now think of the WTO, where again, the US has basically uh, made the appellate body mechanism totally, um, basically, uh, um, um, uh, collapsed um, uh, since um, uh, since two years. So, I mean, you can also uh, contest from the inside and still uh, stay in the game. Then uh, a fifth uh, 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 remark, the crisis of multilateralism, which again is a very big, um, big field of study and, and that really has to do with lots of things. But I think it, especially in today's uh, context, we see that multilateral organizations, they require a certain mindset, a certain attitude of states to really work positively together. But also you need decision-making processes that are really, uh, you know, that are able to work in today's context. That's not very easy, but we know that many of our international organizations starting with the United Nations are getting a little bit old and are not fully able to reform themselves, to adapt themselves to the 21st century. I come back to this issue when I deal with the report of the Secretary General, our common agenda. Last but not least, what I really find very worrying, and you could probably say, well, does this have anything to do with the rule of law? I think it does, and that's the enormous uh, re-rise of inequality. And, and the COVID uh, pandemic has de definitely um, uh, contributed to that. Inequalities between countries, within countries, are enormously on the rise. And I think that that poses a huge, huge challenge also for the international uh, rule of law. How can you speak about an international rule of law if there is such an incredible inequity and such incredible inequality um, between and within uh, countries? Now, the positive news, uh, because this all sounds pretty depressive, 
I think there are positive tendencies which we should never uh, disregard. I, I would start by saying there are, of course, many areas where international law is, is actually being complied with, where it is actually uh, alive and, and kicking. And there are many good dynamics also at the regional level. If global mechanisms are sometimes um, not able to reform themselves or are, are stuck uh, at regional and sub-regional levels, we sometimes see really remarkable um, dynamics. And all of these are, in a way, forms of international law and establishing at least at local or regional levels some kind of rule of law based uh, communities. Let's also not forget the continuing work of international courts. That's, of course, something that, you know, is less uh, obvious, less visible, but it continues. And, and I think um, there we, we, it's a gradual, continuous contribution by a great multitude of courts besides not just the, the ICJ and uh, the international criminal tribunals and the ones we know at the global level, but again, increasingly regional and sub-regional and also national courts um, um, continuing to work on international uh, law. And then what I would broadly consider positive, but there our opinions may also diverge, is what I would call um, the, the whole new set of approaches to international, um, say, cooperation going from informal lawmaking processes through uh, peer review uh, mechanisms such as the Universal Periodic Review in the UN Human Rights Council, to working yeah, global governance by indicators, as it has been called, uh, the processes like uh, Agenda 2030 of the United Nations, uh, the Sustainable Development Go Goals, with all their targets and the underlying indicators, and so on and so forth. You could say, well, that's not very legally binding, but the processes are there. And um, I think if, if, if uh, we really do a good job, this could also lead to some uh, results. I'm not sure, uh, Chairman, if you would allow me to elaborate briefly on the two other points, if my time is already up. Yeah, please, please go ahead and uh, come back to the agenda. Yes. Well, then that's that's my second point, the, uh, the report of the Secretary General. This is a remarkable document. Uh, it's very, it's very thorough. It's very big. Uh, it contains lots of food for of thought, and I really think uh, it, it should be taken more seriously and studied more thoroughly by the academic uh, community. But so the, the, the Secretary General in that report has uh, come up with his vision after broad consultations on how, what is the way forward for international cooperation and uh, for the United Nations, but also for, um, let's say, dealing with the big challenges of our times, including the global commons, uh, delivering global public goods uh, in an efficient manner, uh, and so on. And, uh, speaking uh, of, of, of the approach of the report, there are many sides to this, but what I like first of all is the idea of the Secretary General that we need to go towards a new kind of social contract. It's very interesting to read the paragraphs about that social contract in, in, in the report of the Secretary General because he goes out of his way to highlight that this is not just a European concept, but that this is something of a universal notion which you find in many other cultures uh, and so on. But it's, it's interesting to see that part and parcel of that new social contract, there's a lot about human rights, of course, but part and parcel of it also includes a lot of thinking about the rule of law, where the Secretary General says, well, we should promote a new vision on the rule of law. We should build on the SDGs, in particular, the well-known SDG number 16, but also on the document that I haven't heard about until now, and um, that is the 2012 declaration of the high level meeting of the UN General Assembly on the rule of law at national and international levels, which, to be honest, I found always a, a very interesting document, amazing that it was adopted. I'm not sure if uh, 10 years later it would still be adopted by the General Assembly. But uh, of course, sadly, although there was talk of a follow up process, um, this has become uh, apparently less of a concern for the international uh, community. And the, the Secretary General is trying to revive the good ideas that were already in that two 2012 uh, declaration. Then um, on, on a second point in that common agenda, how to improve uh, our dealing with global commons. And uh, um, Heike has already mentioned a couple of uh, initiatives. 
I think indeed um, we, we have to um, renew some existing, um, say, uh, international instruments. Uh, my pet uh, example are the Outer Space Treaties of the United Nations, which all date from the Cold War period, the 1960s and the 1970s. And it, given the current um, rapid developments with regard to space, both uh, national space programs, the, the militarization of space, but also the enormous rise of commercial actors, it's clear that we, we need a total redesign of outer space law. And so that's, that's being highlighted also by the Secretary General, but think also of the law of the sea. I mean, I can mention the UN Con Convention on the law of the sea, but uh, what do we do with ocean debris and all the incredible problems of dealing with, um, say, um, uh, the uh, free riding uh, with regard to the management of the oceans. So, I mean, it's clear that we need to strengthen existing agreements or come up with uh, new, um, say, uh, mechanisms uh, there. Similarly, for, for global public goods, you need uh, an improvement of governance mechanisms. Now, there are no, uh, ne not necessarily concrete ideas in the report of the Secretary General. He is in favor of creating a so-called high-level advisory board to identify global public goods and other areas of global interest, and then really to um, indicate certain suggestions for governance uh, improvements. I hope this will indeed come about. Um, it's still early in the day. The General Assembly on the 15th of November has adopted a positive uh, resolution about the Secretary General's report, but the precise processes to, to implement it are not uh, altogether entirely clear. Last but not least, very interesting and courageous. The Secretary General really calls for a, a new form of multilateralism for the 21st century. And that's what he calls a networked multilateralism. That is not just the traditional intergovernmental approach, but really drawing together existing capacities and um, say the inputs from civil society, parliaments, academia, uh, just name it, all the other forces that are out there but that are currently not sufficiently tapped upon within the United Nations intergovernmental uh, context. Chairman, I would like to say a few words about the European Union, but I have the feeling I've, speaking already, I've spoken already too long, so maybe I can do that at the next stage of our conversations. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Jan, uh, for your intervention and the uh, uh, the tour de force um, uh, that you that you gave uh, uh, for us, um, pointing to the various um, problematic uh, indicators uh, that are currently challenging the international rule of law, but at the same time also some um, would say um, some evidence for hope. Um, now, uh, perhaps we can uh, turn to the questions from the audience, uh, and I would like to remind the audience as well to please um, uh, write down your questions in the chat. Um, I see one um, very interesting question uh, currently in the chat. Um, by Rui Marquez Pinto, who basically is asking uh, the question how, uh, and I guess this question is for all of you, um, how actually the rule of law, international law can coexist with individualism or what he calls a concept, um, uh, the concept of individualism uh, without both being damaged according to the democratic and human rights principles of freedom of choice. Now, uh, that is, uh, of course, uh, a, a very um, interesting question that is uh, also pointing to the relationship between international relations on the one hand, international law on the one hand, and uh, human um, rights, um, for example, on the other, um, if we want to look at that that way. Um, but I see currently no other questions in the chat. This is why I would also like to invite um, the audience again to write down more questions in the chat. I have basically written down a couple of questions myself why, while you were talking, all of you. And I have basically again, the, the topic uh, that we are um, looking at in mind, which is basically the future of the international rule of law and the question, what are the 
European and US perspectives here. And uh, one of the uh, intriguing aspects coming out of the talk of, of Heike was uh, for me, um, how actually we can, so to speak, uh, convince uh, what you call the global north, be it the, the United States, be it Canada, be it, be it the European Union, be it the UK, um, how can we actually um, uh, make convincing arguments that it is worth investing uh, in the international rule of law? It seems to me that uh, there is a certain narrative uh, currently uh, coming from the US, from coming from the Biden administration, uh, but please, um, I would really like to hear all of your opinions on that, uh, which has to do with the concept of resilience uh, and that there is a connect seemingly between what we may call the rule of rule of law at home, domestic rule of law and democracy on the one hand and the international rule of law. There seems to be this connection in the narrative that we need to strengthen our domestic rule of law practices. We need to strengthen our own democracies in order to be able to contribute to the international rule of law. Um, and um, I, 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 I was thinking about that, especially when Heike was uh, making her comments on, on how difficult it seems to be for the global north to actually live up to its obligations and commitments in the first place. So to which degree would we actually need to have that, so to speak, um, uh, domestic input? And then for, uh, it's a question more for Ian, but I guess also for all others. Um, Ian, I, I, I saw in your, in your intervention, this very, of course, strong, um, uh, the strong connect to politics and and the fact that we may um, what we may call what what the international rule of law is depends on what uh, states uh, make of it what actually politics makes of it um, and the question that I have is whether you see actually a change in the justification practice um, around the the international rule of law not so much the question that actually states are using uh, the international rule of law for their own um, for their own needs and that the international rule of law becomes um, a, a resource um, but also the question to which degree we are actually seeing a change um, for example during the trump years um, i'm wondering how we can so to speak see from your perspective uh, from your also conceptual perspective how you see the engagement with the international rule of law um, uh, how can we make sense of that um, incident uh, uh, of the uh, Trump uh, administ uh, administration and how would you make sense of that um, in terms of the justification um, around the international rule of law. Um, and then for, uh, for Jan, I was wondering uh, when you when you hinted at uh, the network multilateralism, but please all uh, be free to, to also take on my questions yourself. When you hinted at the networked multilateralism, uh, the, uh, is that really a recipe? If we, if we, look, at, uh, if we look at what um, uh, Heike mentioned, uh, for example, uh, there was a very strong critique coming out of her intervention on certain forms of networking, um, informal networks that were actually undermining the international rule of law. What would it need to actually have a networked multilateralism um, really contributing to the international rule of law and not um, many lateralisms, uh, many informal networks that are claiming uh, to a certain degree all that they are beneficial for the international rule of law? What would it need? What would we uh, perhaps also see as some sort of best practices uh, currently um, in? the context of the international rule of law. With these questions, I, I, I give the floor back to you. I see that more questions are now coming in, but perhaps we can take these as a first round. And perhaps Heike, you want to start? 
Yeah, thank you, Kalia, for, for the uh, great questions uh, and uh, the points you've made. Um, how can we convince states of the global north that it's worth investing in the rule of law and why does it have to do, uh, or what does it have to do with domestic democratic uh, uh, challenges? I think the migration crisis uh, shows to some extent how much these issues are interrelated. Um, the non-compliance with obligations towards migrants in many EU, EU member states that have been brought before the European Court of Human Rights and have been successfully challenged, I think, show that um, how we internally deal with rights and, and human rights also affects uh, our external relations. Um, it shows to what extent European states are also under internal pressures to give in on certain obligations because for fears of populism, right-wing policies, uh, uh, which, which is a very predominant uh, subject matter in Europe these days. Um, and also, I think, further with the, with the, with the longer the pandemic lasts, uh, so um, I guess uh, here we have a have a strong uh, a relation, and it, it it brings me to that issue of of non-compliance about which Ian has talked, um, and and I agree with him in principle that non-compliance per se is not a problem to to a legal order, uh, and and norm research, uh, for instance, uh, demonstrates that non-compliance might even be useful to obtain norms. So so it's 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 part uh, or maintain norms. It's part of the game, but I think the problem with non-compliance that we currently see is that it's part of these of that what I would now call protracted turbulences. I mean we are in this situation of turbulences now ah eight years, nine years uh, in, in, in at least to a severe degree. And um, here I think non-compliance adds to an overall impression of eroding norms, reducing stability and uh, making conflicts more likely. And I think the problem with it is that international law is, is by many seen as a kind of superstructure, but it's not imposed as a superstructure because it's based on state's consent. So the problem of, of um, non-compliance is in the end also a problem of uh, uh, contradicting yourself. If you commit to a treaty, um, then you can at least be uh, expected to follow it. You can withdraw. I mean, Lawyers tend to be uh, skeptical about withdrawals, but I still think that withdrawals are something that is within the system and we don't always have to have more law uh, uh, to necessarily have uh, an established international rule of law. But I think once you have committed to a treaty and you don't comply, then you create tensions and uh, lacks of of uh, uh, coherence. Um, and uh, I think these, these uh, tensions between doing one thing and saying one thing, that is what is, is, is detrimental uh, to an understanding of a rule of law in the long run. Thanks. Thank you very much, Heike. Um, Ian. Yeah, thanks for all these questions. Uh, that's a pretty long catalog of very interesting topics. Uh, Kalia that you've raised. Um, the domestic analogy is really very interesting. Uh, in addition to the themes that you've both raised on it, I, I also think of the domestic rule of law in the American context as a, in concrete terms, for instance, around rules that, for instance, used to say that African-Americans could not own a home in the neighborhood that I live in. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that in the US, the law said that you an African-American wasn't allowed to move to the state of Illinois without uh, a sponsor who would validate their good character and their, and their bank account. Um, you know, these are questions of the rule of law as well. And if we take a kind of generalized, abstracted, ideal type model of the rule of law that, that assumes that, uh, that law following is always the right answer, then we get into trouble when we encounter these very practical cases of specific laws that make life harder for people rather than easier. So the domestic rule of law is a bit of a tangle as well, just as the international rule of law is. And I think maybe what it comes down to for me is that scholars sometimes compare an idealized form of law 
or, or begin with the assumption that what law means is a certain kind of, of beneficial public goods framework and travel from there to a practical application without considering what has changed along the way. So the practical look at specific laws can pay more attention to who gains and who loses, who's paying the costs for this specific rule, how it's written, and who is getting the benefits. When we look at specific rules, we can think about racial segregation laws, for instance, or international trade laws with a winner and loser lens quite easily. If we're thinking in abstract terms about a generalized ideal type model of what a legal system looks like, it's hard to see those trade-offs. So in a sense, where I'm headed with this, uh, this line of thinking is to remind international law scholars to think about the specific winners and losers, the specific rules that they're talking about, and the specific alternatives. So the alternative to, let's say, the intellectual protection laws in the WTO are not necessarily no rules and complete anarchy and war to decide which movies get copyright protection and which don't. The realistic alternative is these rules or some other rules. And then we can compare how benefits are being distributed between two plausibly alternative uh, bodies of rule. That kind of specific comparison, I think, is really important, really useful, because it gives us a little bit of leverage to think about how these particular rules are impacting people and how we feel about that particular distribution of gains and losses. So as we go from the abstract form of the rule of law in general to the specific substance of actual rules, I think things get easier for me to judge the political uh, gains and losses. Um, and your mention of the domestic analogy uh, helped spark that realization in me uh, and might be useful in the conversation. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, Jan, um, do you want to come in? With pleasure, with pleasure. I, I'm going to um, <clears throat> speak about this network multilateralism. And of course, the Secretary General is not um, a neutral player. He, of course, works for the UN. So if you read the, um, <clears throat> the full sentence where he uh, advocates this network multilateralism, it's basically saying that uh, it is networked and inclusive multilateralism anchored within the United Nations. So, I mean, clearly not a new thing, but the UN should still be the central convening uh, forum. And that as such, I think is, is, is not so, so problematic. The question is how to organize this, because of course, at the, at the global level, bringing all um, the stakeholders or uh, other uh, actors uh, with expertise and with uh, say um, uh, with certain, if you wish, uh, forms of representativeness in is a very, it's a very tricky kind of uh, exercise. But uh, there are a couple of examples in the report of the Secretary General. He speaks about uh, launching a multi-stakeholder dialogue, for instance, with regard to the reform of outer space laws. He speaks also, and I like that idea, about having a biannual summit between the, the leaders of the G20 one of those, well, mini-lateralist clubs, eh, as we, 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 we heard, uh, the G20, and having a biannual summit uh, between them and ECOSOC, the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations. It's a long, um, I think, aspiration and, and frustration of the UN that they, they felt the G20 basically um, uh, became so important and dynamic that it, it, it has put uh, the role of the uh, the UN a bit in the shadows. And so that's a way of them to try to link those processes or maybe even create something of a, of a light form of accountability for, for the G20. Um, he also speaks about creating an advisory group on local and regional uh, governments, which is an interesting idea. Now, look, um, all of these things, of course, need still to be uh, going through processes with the membership of the United Nations. And uh, one thing we know also from um, diplomats working, uh, representing their governments at the UN, they like to stay in control. 
Eh? They, they um, diplomats have never liked uh, to, to, to have too many stakeholders involved in um, uh, the intergovernmental processes at the UN. So in that sense, I'm, I'm curious to see how much, um, say, impact the Secretary General can have in, in turning uh, the UN into a much more widely networked and inclusive uh, organization. I very much like the ideas, the actual practicalities of putting it um, in, in, in effects are really not easy. But I should say the UN actually has a kind of a tradition also in that respect. What do I mean? It was the very first organization in ECOSOC that gave a consultative status to civil society organizations. And look at the number of civil societies organizations with that consultative status. Um, that's been there since the 1940s, very, very progressive in a way. It's also, uh, say, previous secretary generals, which started uh, reaching out to other forms of stakeholders. Uh, the regional organizations is something which Butros Ghali already started with, with his agenda for peace in 1992. Think of Kofi Annan's uh, outreach to the private sector, the business community with initiatives such as the Global Compact, uh, but also to regional organizations, um, civil society actors, and so on. So this is something that uh, you know we have seen previous processes, and I just hope that governments will remember this and that they uh, will indeed respect that um, if the UN still wants to play a credible and, and legitimate role in global governance that we, we need indeed this much more inclusive. It's a recipe against fragmentation. This is also what is highlighted in the Common Agenda report. And I think um, the Secretary General has a good point there. Thank you very much, Jan. And I would like to point that uh, back to actually Heike and Ian and, and ask whether from their uh, critical reading uh, of uh, the uh, current developments in the international rule of law, but also a critical reading of the international rule of law, whether, whether you could actually envision uh, a participatory rule of law making that would actually allow um, us uh, to, to think about um, the outcome of that lawmaking process as beneficial um, to an actually large number of norm takers. Uh, uh, so if I, if I understand Ian um, and his la last uh, comments um, uh, correctly, then the, one of the big problems is that there is um, somebody who benefits, but also a, a, a winner, but also obviously there is a larger group of losers. Uh, would actually participatory, um, let's say inclusive uh, lawmaking increase the chance that we could actually overcome that situation? Or would you from a critical perspective say, no, there is always, uh, 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 there is always some sort of hierarchy, there is always, um, also a hegemon that we should look at, um, who in the end dictates um, what we call the international rule of law. In the meantime, we have two additional questions uh, in the chat, which I would also like to point um, to you, one by Stephen Haynes, who um, uh, has um, uh, given us the example of the UNCLOS, um, uh, actual the UNCLOS, um, and uh, his question in that regard is, um, how can there be an effective rule of law internationally if existing law cannot effectively be changed over time to take account of major developments? So how can we make sure that actually the international rule of law um, is actually able to take major international developments into account? And then Hannes Remmert, uh, one of our students here from Leuven is asking um, breaches of the prohibition of violence has been mentioned often as a problem for the international rule of law, and we have mentioned it here as well in our discussion. Uh, what role does international humanitarian law play for a solution to mitigate the banalization of breaches of international law? Should it be adapted to modern war warfare? Uh, for example, drone strikes. Um, so we have um, a question that I, I pointed out, and then we have two more from the chat. Thank you very much for, for the participants in the in the audience. Um, Ian, would you would you like to start this time with your uh, reflections? 
Sure. Um, I, mean, I think I would probably begin from the premise that all forms of governance involve winners and losers. I don't think that's particularly controversial. I think we can all understand that. If we think about domestic tax law, it's quite clear that any way that you write the tax rules benefits some people, some kinds of income, some kinds of wealth, and impose costs on others. So I don't see that as a, as a critical position. I think it's sort of a fact of life of governance. I'm encouraging us to think in the same way about the international rule of law, and even more concretely about particular international rules that we might be studying as researchers and ask the question, how is this rule distributing costs and benefits as we might if somebody proposed an international tax treaty or new rules on shipping pollution uh, or the outer space rules that we've talked about before. There will of course be uh, winners and losers and it's worth thinking about how those costs are distributed. Now as to the question of whether the glass is half full or half empty, uh, I think this position I'm advocating would suggest that, that it's not really a glass, it's more like a fire hose, let's say. So it's got a direction. The, the state of the international rule of law is not, not a scalar variable, it's a vector. So it's moving in some direction, being used for some political purpose. And if we want to analyze uh, its state, we want to think about the use to which it's being put. And on that, my sense is that strong governments have gotten quite good at manipulating international rules and institutions to serve their interests. Uh, and that we see this in the way that um, legal justifications and, and multilateral forms have been deployed to defend the policies of of the Russian government, and, and we see this in the language of the Chinese government and their, their recent um, shift towards being all in favor of the international rule of law once it's understood their way, which I would say is not that different than what the Americans have been saying for a long time, that the international rule of law is great as long as it's understood as the US is, uh, is taking a lead position. So I think there is an authoritarian uh, turn in international law that is that I bring up not by way of, of criticism or as a critic, but as a scholarly observation that seems to me to be a fact of uh, the social life these days of how international legal institutions are being directed, that is to say, to which political purpose. All of which makes me a little bit excited about what, uh, what Jan and Heike too have been talking about, about the kind of um, a kind of dispersal of, of discursive partners in international legal forms as new voices, as the small island states get organized. Uh, the COP26 process had a fair amount of this. There's sort of a, a, a bubbling, uh, you know, disaggregation of political authority in some of these settings where, where the, the strong states perhaps are not having the, the uh, not getting the microphone uh, for quite as much time as they would have before. But uh, those are hopeful. But I think that, unfortunately, I'm a little bit pessimistic in, in looking at the current state of international institutions and seeing a pretty efficient domination by the strongest governments who are able to exploit what looks to me like kind of the authoritarian core of legal supremacy for their own purposes. Thank you so much for your for your intervention, Ian, and and the clarification. I think that's that's really interesting. I'm I'm now really looking forward to the to the intervention by Heike and see what what she thinks. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, let me let me start with your question on on uh, how I uh, evaluate the participatory more inclusive lawmaking processes. I think that is, as Ian has just said, an, an important way forward, but I fear there are limits to it. Um, I'm not so sure about processes where NGOs get a place at the table in international negotiations. Um, that might work under certain circumstances, but I, I don't think that it will work under all circumstances. I would like to think about such a kind of network multilateralism um, in a broader way, uh, saying that um, 
different actors can take different roles at different places. So I'd say that strategic litigation, for instance, uh, is an example where uh, non-state actors and individuals have a strong role to play to, to chase states to comply with their obligations. Uh, climate litigation uh, is a case in point. The German Constitutional Court gave a quite a strong judgment uh, on uh, how Germany has to fulfill its um, obligations under the Paris Agreement and um, and and it even opened it slightly opened up uh, uh, the room for transnational litigation in this respect and it relied on 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 the Paris Agreement and international cooperation and I think these are indirect ways for other actors to to promote such a kind of network multilateralism and and I really do think that this is a promising way forward. However. I also fear that in the end, it might a bit contribute to, to creating these two international orders. One that is somehow amongst a democratic state where individuals get access to courts and can do all these things. And on the other hand, uh, then we have this autocratic turn where we have states where, where individuals can't do that. And uh, th there is an imbalance in such a kind of system that, that might create uh, in a nearer future, might create in itself a problem for the international rule of law. And, and I would also like to turn to, to the question from the audience and, and both question, does IHL need adaption? And can we talk about an international rule of law where we can't change major international agreements? Um, I, I do completely agree that it is a major challenge for international law, that, that it cannot be um, changed, that all these founding treaties, these big conventions uh, are currently um, uh, somehow frozen and, and, and can't formally change. However, I think that this is not the only way that law offers to, to adapt agreements and to adapt legal rules to changing circumstances. And I think we should not forget that we have a number of functional equivalents to formally changing or formally creating a new uh, international agreement. And that would be um, uh, methodolog methodological approaches such as interpretative approaches. Uh, I think it was very much on purpose that the ILC had this long project on subsequent state practice because subsequent state practice is now the major instrument and to reform international organizations. Um, and the same uh, holds true for systematic interpretation. The problem of integrating human rights obligations in the law of the sea cannot be done through a formal way, but it can be integrated via interpretative approaches. And, and I still think these are very important um, yeah, functional equivalents that, that play a particularly strong role uh, in, in international law and in an understanding of the international rule of law. We don't really know subsequent practice in national law. And I think for, for exactly these reasons, because it's such an equivalent to formal forms of changing the rules. Thanks. Thank you so much, Heike. Um, Jan, would you like to come in? Briefly, but three points. Um, I fully agree with Heike with regard to um, what she said on um, the problem of reforming existing international agreements. Let's also not forget there is something like customary international law and that in fact we come from that. Eh? So in a way you see these processes, you see chaotic, sometimes uh, very inconsistent, um, say lines of behavior, but you see a kind of commonality emerging, state practice and, and convictions, and then you get something of customary law, then it gets written down in a treaty text, the codification process, and then the treaty, the codified law becomes a little bit, um, let's say, fossilized or at least uh, obsolete, and you see new forms of subsequent practice, but also probably new forms of um, customary um, international law. So in that sense, um, there are dynamics in international law that, that can, can stem as hopeful. But I, I fully agree, as such, it is a very problematic thing to say we have a treaty and we cannot reform it. Just like you have an international organization and you cannot reform it. That's a huge problem. And, and there are limits to, let's say, uh, rhyming, reconciling subsequent practice with the idea, the very idea of rule of law and transparency of the law and of the rules, right? Okay. Um, on, the, on the second question, yes, the breaches of the use of force. Um, international humanitarian law offers a couple of tools. Uh, Heike already mentioned the beautiful International Fact-Finding Commission that has uh, 
uh, not had many mandates and missions until now, and I'm afraid uh, uh, not in the future either. But yes, uh, we have to continue to push for uh, certain uh, mechanisms, at least in, in naming and shaming the ones who are per uh, perpetrating those international crimes. And um, I think there I find a very interesting relatively recent development, the, the emergence of quite a number of investigative mechanisms, uh, commissions of inquiry, uh, fact-finding commissions uh, that have been uh, put, uh, say, uh, that have been uh, mandated by, either by the UN Human Rights Council to document war crimes, uh, or by even the General Assembly with regard to the investigative mechanism in Syria. So these are all, if you wish, practical steps to at least document the uh, atrocities and, and the grave violations of human rights and humanitarian law that have taken place in order, hopefully, at some stage to have, uh, let's say, international criminal tribunals or even national criminal tribunals use that evidence in order to hold perpetrators um, accountable. So I hope uh, in that way we can, we can do something with the, those very cynical and uh, that banalization of violations of the, 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 the laws of uh, war that I've mentioned already. Now something on what Ian said re regarding the authoritarian turn. And this is a famous article in the American Journal of International Law, also by one of our good colleagues and friends. But I mean, of course, uh, major powerful governments uh, manipulate the language. And I uh, give one example. I've at the time of the Iraq war, and I really mean the Iraq invasion of 2003, I also remember all the arguments between American lawyers and policymakers and the Europeans. And I mean, uh, I remember the very creative way in which the Bush administration was arguing that actually it was not about, uh, say, an illegal operation, no, that it was a reawakening of the old authorization of use of force that the Security Council had given to the US and its coalition back in 1990 yeah, and the, the previous Gulf War were very creative, uh, say, legal interpretation. But at least it was a legal interpretation and a format had a, 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 an attempt at creating something of, a, of, of legality uh, in what was, uh, in essence, a very problematic um, operation. Now, um, but so, yeah, if you today you hear arguments about Russia saying, well, we're just exercising the responsibility to protect by uh, intervening in Georgia, in, in uh, Ukraine, and so on, or we are trying to stop a genocide, you know, all these, uh, this incredible uh, instrumentalization uh, and manipulation of legal terminology. Yeah, that's of course a very gross, but there are other, I think in a way, more perverse things um, currently happening. And let me give you one example. That's the Human Rights Council, where we see China now very, very actively, even aggressively engaged in trying to change the international human rights discourse from within. So uh, they're not yet very successful with it, but you know, uh, China, is uh, usually a quick learner in international organizations. They have invested hugely in, uh, let's say, uh, upgrading their influence and role within the United Nations system. And so we see really in a couple of recent, um, um, say, sessions of the Human Rights Council, how China is really trying to, to positively, but positively in its own sense, change the international human rights discourse. And that's something I think really where we have to do something about it. And there I come to the European Union because the EU with all of its defects is trying at least to have a common discourse in the Human Rights Council, having its member states that are on the Human Rights Council act and react and counteract and so on uh, with regard to such uh, say um, efforts um, that, that China for instance is making. It's a big clash and I think the clash will only get worse from January onwards when the United States rejoins the Human Rights Council. Then I think 2022 is going to be a year of big, big clashes within uh, the Human Rights Council. So because you know also Russia has been very active there um, in the Human Rights Council. I think that that's really going to be a place uh, where, we, where we see a lot of uh, firework coming. But speaking about EU, if I may, uh, Kolya, I think indeed um, we have to seriously think about ways in which the EU can positively contribute to a strengthening of the international rule of law. 
And there, I think it's important for us to really, um, if you wish, take a more holistic view of the various instruments at the disposal of the EU, but also the lack of certain tools. Uh, when I look at the instruments in international relations, in fact, uh, I see mainly three. I see the discourse. I call it the discourse. This is basically developing um, uh, common uh, uh, positions uh, within international organizations in bilateral uh, dialogues um, with countries such as the human rights dialogues that the EU does with more than uh, 80 countries in the world. And so I think that there is really, I mean, we have to defend uh, the rule of law and let's say the integrity of the international human rights system, for instance, in my example. The same with regard to humanitarian law, but I, I agree with Heike, the EU has does not have a consistent uh, track record in that field. Sometimes I wonder whether it has to do with a lack of expertise and eh? because uh, they don't always uh, master all the nitty grit of the technicalities of humanitarian law. But uh, so I think that 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 could probably change for the better in the future, because uh, there are some now very good people with knowledge of international law within the EEAS and, and so on. So I, I have high hopes that this will improve in the future. But so there is a discourse. There is the funding. Uh, let's not forget the EU is a, a major funder of international projects that all try to, if you wish, um, construct a better world, uh, say supporting human rights dynamics in, in, in many, many third countries, supporting um, the international rule of law, for instance, the International Criminal Court, the EU funding uh, also uh, institutions such as the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, and there I must point to the recent um, regulation of the 9th of June of this year, which is basically the very new instrument for all the international, the external funding mechanisms of the European Union under the current multi-annual program. So a major new regulation, very big document, which um, uh, refers at least 35 times to the rule of law and where the rule of law is really one of the priorities uh, in the uh, new instrument and where I think actually there is mention also that the EU may suspend um, this assistance to third countries when they're really violating the rule of law. It's not very well developed in the regulation, but I'm sure they will come back uh, to that. So the funding arm, it's softish, it's not very powerful, it's probably sometimes too fragmented, but you know, it's a little bit the biblical story of the small seeds, you know, that hopefully will be planted and lead to some bottom up dynamics in countries. I think it's a, it's an important thing the EU does. And then last but not least. Jan, we need to, we need to briefly wrap up because our time is running out. That's why I say last. Uh, and, and that's basically leading by example. I come back to your question about domestic uh, yeah. compliance. The EU has big troubles within the membership its own membership with regard to rule of law backsliding. And we have to really deal with those problems because otherwise we lack any credibility and legitimacy to tackle those issues at the international level. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And I would like to give the, our time is indeed already over time, um, but I would like to give the last words to, to, to Heike and to Ian um, to perhaps comment on uh, what has been said. We have also a couple of uh, additional questions in the chat. I'm afraid we cannot tackle all of them uh, at this stage, um, but perhaps Ian and Heike, you can uh, make uh, your last comments and uh, uh, try to sketch um, what you expect um, in the next a uh, couple of, uh, let's say, years uh, of the US administration to be changing in terms of the international rule of law or whether we rather see the same good old. Jan has already alluded to the EU, so perhaps we should focus in our last um, comments very briefly, one minute each on the United States. Yeah, maybe as a European, I, I'll I'll start, and uh, I I I think I do think very much that uh, we 
we we will see um, and we are seeing a change in style obviously i mean it's not that outrageous violations of international law combined with an outrageous rhetoric that we had under the trump administration but i think the principal treatback of the us from the international system and its wish to uh, decouple from china and from russia within many international fora is something that both administrations share and that we are going to see more of in the future because the role as a hegemon changes it's undermined now it's undermined in legitimacy terms it's undermined in effectiveness terms and uh, i guess the us um, administration will um, will see it uh, more promising for their own undertakings not to let's say care for the whole world but to more clearly even more clearly uh, 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 focus on 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 their fields of interest and and thus not entertain for instance a legally embedded multilateralism thank you thank you so much heike ian the last word to you well, I would just say, from my view, it looks like the rule of law framework in international affairs is pretty well embedded and entrenched and not in any danger. I think that there is not really an alternative discourse to uh, international rules. What Trump was doing, I think, was just being a, a basic kind of swindler um, of the type that we see all the time in domestic affairs, somebody who's sort of happy to cheat the system as long as they can get away with it. Uh, I don't see that as a threat to the system. Um, it's more just a, a common or garden uh, criminal. So the rule of law framework, I think, is quite in place. That's not going to change. I think the real question is, do, or, do governments see um, existing institutions as having a payoff for their goals and purposes in much the same way that we might say of people? Do, we, do individuals feel that the institutions are serving them well or not? Uh, and that's a kind of substantive empirical question that can only be answered with respect to specific institutions and specific rules measured against plausible alternatives. It's not a question that has a grand once and for all answer across the whole system. It's a thing that requires us to look specifically at the details. That's what I see the Biden administration doing, looking at the details of individual agreements and institutions and measuring their payoff. Thank you so much to all of you uh, for your interventions, for your um, comments, your reflections on the question, uh, what is the future of the international rule of law uh, from European perspectives, from the American perspective. But I think we also um, saw a very lively debate uh, between international public lawyers on the one hand and um, international relations scholars um, and the very different ways of how we can actually reflect on the international rule of law, including uh, the question of what is the ultimate purpose of the international rule of law. So thank you very much uh, to uh, Heike Krieger, to Ian Hurt, and also to Jan Wouters for being with us tonight. It's a great pleasure. And uh, to the audience for um, being with us. I wish all of you a really nice day, a good evening, and a very nice um, seasonal celebration. Um, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.